Welcome. I'm Renee Hawks, Chair of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center Professional Advisory Council. I'm so glad to be able to spend this next hour with you, sharing the good work happening at the Hutch. My personal connection to the Hutch began when my best friend, best friend's daughter, Vivian, was diagnosed with DIPG, which is a brain tumor that has no known cure and it's inoperable. This pure sweet child did not make it to age six. My heartbreak made way to passion for finding a cure for cancer. And it's likely that the solution to cancer is gonna come right here in our backyard, probably from Fred Hutch. The research capabilities and collaboration that happen here are second to none. And they have made bold commitments to finding a cure for cancer. Now, our advisory council is made up of 20 professionals, 20 plus, we have a couple more now, driven by the need to serve. It's an incredibly active and passionate group, and I'm super proud to be affiliated with them. We give advice on charitable planning, on strategizing outreach activities, and providing a connection between you, your clients, our allied professional group, and the Hutch. Now, if you're at this event, we consider you a part of our allied professionals. We find that estate planners, attorneys, CPAs, tax advisors, investment managers, trust professionals, these are all people who are first in line to have that touch point with our clients. And these are the people that are gonna be inspiring a new class, a new group of philanthropists. We know that you can address our philanthropies, our th philanthropists need for financial security and, fi and family legacy while investing in the programs that are gonna advance the Fred Hutch goals of eliminating cancer infectious diseases, and moving forward basic science. Today's event is being recorded, and we will get an email out to you sometime in the next week. I hope that you will share this. If it's, you know, if you find something interesting in it, I want you to share it with your friends, your family, your neighbors, anyone who you think that might be interested in hearing this information. Okay, not everybody on this call is gonna be really familiar with the Hutch. So I'm gonna start right now to read some facts. Seattle-based Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center is a global leader in cancer, infectious disease, and basic science research. More than 3,000 scientists and staff, over 240 labs are working together across disciplines to tackle disease from all angles. The Hutch is partnering with leading technology companies across our region to accelerate the pace of research by leveraging advances in machine learning and AI. Partnering across sectors allow them to invest in the boldest ideas and take them all the way from the lab to the patients in the clinic. Cancer is at the heart of the mission, but it's really just the start of what they do. They're also a powerhouse in infectious disease research. And since the start of this pandemic, Hutch scientists have been tracking the virus, studying how it behaves in our bodies, developing tests and treatments, and leading a massive vaccine trial as part of Project Warp Speed. Hutch researchers quickly became a trusted source of information and they've helped us make sense of the science that was evolving every day. So we're here to hear from Fred Hutch's president, Tom Lynch, and two experts whose work are shedding new light in pancreatic cancer and brain function. We'll hear briefly from each panelist and then we'll pause and open questions from the chat. Um, you should find the chat function somewhere up in the right-hand corner. It's my pleasure to kick off this program by welcoming Tom Lynch. Tom is president and director of Fred Hutch and the holder of the Ray's Beck Endowed Chair. He's a lung cancer doctor, pioneer in precision medicine and nationally recognized leader in academic medicine. Before joining the Hutch, Tom held leadership positions at the Yale Cancer Center, Mass General and Bristol's Meyer Squibb. He started at the Hutch in February of 2020, can you even imagine, right at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in the US. Tom and the Hutch have worked hard to advance cancer research and playing a pivotal role in the global scientific sprint to end this pandemic. If you don't already follow him on LinkedIn, I would suggest you do, it's really good stuff. So now Tom, it's my pleasure to turn my screen over to you. Renee, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's terrific to be with you folks today and uh, share the enthusiasm we have for the Fred Hutch. So I just wanna start off by saying a couple things. 
a couple of things that happened in the past four days. Four days ago, I learned that one of my best friends, uh, her breast cancer came back seven years and she needs options. And options mean hope. And hope is from breakthroughs. She needs something like that. Yesterday, I heard about a family where their child's leukemia came back despite outstanding initial therapy. They need options. That 10-year-old needs options if we're going to go forward. And at the very essence of this is science and discovery. The same science and discovery that leads to Jimmy Carter still being alive six years after having widely metastatic cancer to the brain um, from melanoma. That same science is reflected in a patient of mine who I took care of 20 years ago, who now is uh, still with us 20 years later, despite having metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. Both of those discoveries came from science, fundamental biology and cancer science. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So a couple of things that's important. The jobs that you have as wealth managers, as estate planners, you interact with people who've been extremely uh, successful and fortunate in their careers uh, to be able to acquire assets to need your services. And the role that philanthropy and private support plays for research is unbelievably important. Now, I've had the pleasure and the uh, incredible good fortune to have worked at several really important places. I worked at, the, at Mass General for 25 years in Boston. I then was the Cancer Center Director at my alma mater at Yale. And then I spent three years running all of research and development for Bristol Myers Squibb. What that taught me was really the cycle of innovation, how the cycle of innovation works. Innovation starts with a basic science idea that happens in the laboratory at the Fred Hutch, at Mass General, at Yale, at Hopkins, at UCSF, down, down in uh, San Francisco. And that's where the nugget of information that eventually leads to a breakthrough, that eventually leads to a drug, which eventually leads to a cure. And if you don't have the fundamental science, when I was at Bristol Myers Squibb, I ran a $6 billion operation. Merck, similar sized operation. Pfizer, similar sized operation. But pharma is really about making products, okay? Pharma is not about the initial ideas that have to come from basic scientists who are unconstrained by quarterly earnings calls and unconstrained by thinking about the need um, to have a return on, on investment, which, which big public corporations and, and even biotechs have to have. And so the investments and the philanthropy is crucial to driving research. Now, you might say, well, doesn't the Hutch get a lot of support from, from uh, the government? Yes, uh, we're the largest recipient of NIH money of any private research institution in the country, which we're incredibly proud of and, and reflects the diversity of the science that goes on at the Fred Hutch. Yet, what I can tell you is that the support in terms of grants covers about 75% of what we need. And, it, and the places where we miss out are those critical dollars which are used to support innovative science, beginning science, science that gets things started. If you notice, the Biden administration is establishing this thing called ARPA-H um, under the leadership uh, of, the, of the former head of the Broad uh, Institute, Eric Lander. And the reason it's being started is they want scientists to take more risk, to try things that are more innovative. We do that at the Hutch too, and that happens only because of the support of our philanthropy community and people who are generous. And people who are generous and have that ability turn to you as their advisors to ask, you know, what can we do? Who can we help? Does it make a difference? And it makes an enormous difference in science. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Hutch. We're known around the world for our expertise in blood cancers. We invented uh, bone marrow transplantation and we lead the world really in cellular immunotherapy research. Great example, the, the, the findings uh, of cellular immunotherapy of how to turn T cells into cancer fighting cells eventually led to technology that was licensed and created the company called Juno. Juno was then bought by Celgene. Celgene was then bought by Bristol Myers Squibb. And now this year, that Hutch technology got approved as an approved therapy by the FDA for patients who've got lymphoma. A remarkable advance. And again, a great example of going from the idea 
to the product. And the idea started at the Hutch, and our motto at the Hutch is cures start here. Um, our research encompasses much about cancer, solid tumors, precision medicine, basic science, data integration. We also have a remarkable group focusing on public health as well as viruses. And we're not going to really spend a lot of time today on viruses, although if you want questions about COVID to ask in the Q&A, we're happy to take some of those. As you may know, about a quarter of our research endeavor is focused on viruses. Initially, that was mostly HIV and human papillomavirus. Obviously, since COVID's come on, it's become increasingly COVID and, and COVID-related research where we played an amazingly important role. So I'd like to do today, I introduce you to two young researchers at the Hutch who are breaking new ground in two areas. One is in pancreatic cancer and the other is in brain science. And the reason I picked these two and the reason they're so important is pancreatic cancer obviously is a very difficult cancer to treat. Many of you may know friends or family that have had it. And then in brain science, it's important to know that what happens at the Hutch, our scientists will investigate areas that they believe are important not ones that I tell them to work on. So brain science is an area that, that you're gonna hear is really motivating to this research group at the Hutch, and we encourage them to continue working and looking in that area because we don't know what the findings will be in a basic science lab that might change the way we treat Alzheimer's disease or change the way we treat brain tumors. And so um, this has remarkable uh, uh, potential. And, and I'd say that like the financial advisors who are on the call today, um, when you folks advise your clients, you talk a lot about long-term investment and the importance of, of what a long-term investment means. And it can take a while before it pays off. And if you think about the Juno example I just gave you, you know, that was a 15-year time frame from when those first discoveries were made uh, until the time it made a difference. So let's now talk to some of our researchers. And after um, uh, we speak to our researchers, we're going to have time for Q&A please use the Q&A feature on, on BlueJeans. It works really well. I'll see the questions that come in. There's no question that's too either wonky or uninformed. They're all great questions if you have them. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Sita uh, Kugel. Sita studies pancreatic cancer, which is one of the most difficult to treat uh, cancers. She also studies liver and bile duct cancers as well. She joined our human biology division in 2017. And since then, she's earned funding from public and private sources, including the V Foundation for Cancer Research, the American Cancer Society, the National Cancer Institute, and Base to Space here in Seattle. Many of you who are sports fans, I happen to be a big sports fan, Jimmy Valvano was someone who was, was a hero of mine and his motivation to create the V Foundation. It's wonderful to see what the V Foundation is doing. And when you meet CETA, you're going to see the remarkable things that they've been able to accomplish. So CETA aims to understand what drives different types of cancer so we can develop targeted treatments for these. So CETA, welcome to today's uh, program. So I'm going to start off by, by saying Sita also trained, did some of her initial training at Mass General Hospital. So she and I have a little bit of a similar background in that, uh, that respect. And I guess the first question that I get asked a lot is what makes pancreatic cancer so difficult to treat? Why, why is it so much harder than lymphoma, for example, or leukemia? First of all, thanks so much, Tom, for that kind introduction. Um, so I, as, as, as you mentioned, I work uh, on both pancreatic cancer and cholangiac carcinoma. So cholangiac carcinoma is a type of uh, liver cancer that originates in the bile ducts. And both of these cancers have very poor prognosis. And uh, this is really partly due to the fact that there are um, no effective screening strategies. So the tumor is found usually very late and only when symptoms arise, which usually means the cancer has already spread. Um, another uh, complexity is that the area surrounding the tumor cells called the tumor microenvironment is very dense um, and immune suppressive and has uh, poor blood perfusion. And so drug delivery can also be very uh, challenging. Uh, uh, tumor cells um, and especially um, uh, pancreatic cancer um, have very unstable genomes and so they can easily adapt to and survive many of the drug therapies we throw at it, and it truly is a survival of the fittest at the cellular level. Um, and then finally, I feel as though um, a challenge is that 
only a small portion of patients uh, with cholangiac carcinoma are just starting to benefit from targeted uh, therapies against specific uh, tumor mutations. However, pancreatic cancer has no uh, targeted therapies. And so the majority of patients uh, with either of these diseases are still being treated with combination chemotherapy as uh, the standard of care. And so, um, and, and thus uh, don't, don't do as well. And so Sita, we're seeing a, a rise in pancreatic cancer as a potential cause of death in the United States. And if trends continue, and this is partially because we've made progress in colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and, and, uh, and prostate cancer. But if trends continue, pancreatic cancer is poised to become the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States after lung cancer. Tell us a little bit about what your lab is doing in the pancreatic cancer world. Sure. Um, so I think it's important to remember that pancreatic cancer is treated as one disease, but it can actually be divided into different subtypes, each with uh, unique biology and vulnerabilities. So in my lab, we are trying to understand the biology that, that drives these different subtypes to be able to find subtype-specific therapies so that we can treat the right patient with the right uh, treatment. Um, and so there are two main uh, subtypes that have been named, the basal and the classical. Uh, basal is more aggressive, and patients with this subtype have a shorter overall um, survival. And we have found uh, that the basal pancreatic tumors are very sensitive to a special class of inhibitors. And we're working on ways uh, to either convert or constrain these subtypes and then treat with, other, with our novel uh, subtype-specific therapies. Um, excitingly, these therapies may also potentially apply to other basal tumors in other cancers, such as uh, breast and bladder. And so we're seeing some um, um, broader applications of our work as well. And you, know, you mentioned a little bit earlier about the, about the microenvironment in, in pancreatic cancer being, being hostile to, to immune cells getting in there or targeted drugs getting in there. Um, is that is the microenvironment problem the idea that it's that you've got this sort of I, the way I've always thought about it in my head is you've got this sort of dense uh, fibroblastic connected tissue stuff which is shielding and 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 making it difficult for the cancer cells to to unmask themselves. Does that appear to be similar in the basal subtype and the other subtypes? Well, that's actually a very interesting question. We're, we're exploring that right now. So we have made a new mouse model of the basal subtype. And some there's, mouse models uh, give you the opportunity to explore uh, the cancer progression at all levels, from initiation all the way to um, the, the tumor eventually spreading and, and metastasizing. And so we can look um, in a very um, uh, time-dependent manner at how the microenvironment may be affected and, and, so, and compare that between, between the subtypes and then go um, and, and see if that is recapitulated in the human tumors. So that is yet to be, uh, to be discovered. Good, good. So Sito, uh, last question before we go on to, to Akansha. What, what made you decide to come to the hut? And, and, and can you talk a little about the scientific culture here? Sure. So um, the Hutch uh, has been the perfect place for me to do uh, translational solid, this, the translational solid tumor science I wanted. Um, it has really uh, removed all boundaries and me to form cross-divisional, but also cross-institutional collaborations. And um, maybe uh, one, a good example would be a program that I'm trying to build um, that's called the Clangia Carcinoma Translational Bioresource. And so uh, we are taking what we learned in pancreas cancer and trying to apply that to Clangia Carcinoma, which, um, as I mentioned previously, is, is equally um, a poor prognosis. And so this collaboration actually involves surgeons, medical oncologists, other, and otherwise cancer agnostic, uh, but superb uh, researchers at the Hutch. And, and we're working together to really collect and distribute tumor samples um, from patients with both localized and advanced disease that has uh, spread. And so that we can understand some of the common driver mutation, what they are doing and whether we can find uh, new therapies. And so uh, we're exploring uh, genomics to see if we can understand the genetic drivers um, of this disease. 
uh, metabolomics uh, to understand the metabolism of the tumor cell and how that might compare to the normal normal cell and how that might have been changed. Um, single cell sequencing so that we can look at the expression of genes in, in different uh, cell populations of the tumor microenvironment. Um, uh, screening of drugs in organotypic uh, slice cultures. And finally, um, immune cell profiling to understand the question, your, that exact question you're asking um, of the immune cell um, population in the tumor microenvironment and their activation uh, status. And I truly believe that combining the information we gather uh, together in one resource will allow us to understand the different genetic subtypes of cholangiocarcinoma, and this will help us identify, um, hopefully, the Achilles heel of the tumors, and also help us uh, to inform treatment of other cancers as well. Dita, thank you so much. I know we're going to have some questions in just a few seconds, but thank you so much for your work and your contribution today. I'd like to next introduce Dr. Akanksha Singhvi. Um, Akanksha studies glial cells, um, or otherwise known as just glia, which make up about half the cells uh, that are in our brain. Uh, glia are intimately connected to neurons, uh, which make up the other half of the cells that are in, the, that are in humans. Uh, Akanksha studies these cells in minuscule worms uh, that she's making some very exciting discoveries about uh, the role that these glial cells play in the nervous system. Akanksha joined the Hutch in 2018, and she's in our basic sciences uh, division. Akanksha, welcome so much, and thank you uh, for being with us today. So I'm going to start off by saying, why? You know, neurons are the ones that carry the critical instructions to move your arm or think about a beautiful day or do, you know, to do different things. The glial cells are kind of the structural, you know, they just hang out and create a, create a setting for that to all happen. So number one, why do you study glial cells? And then the thing that, you know, I don't exactly think of worms as having really developed nervous systems. Why do you study it in worms instead of in mammals or humans? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, Tom, for having me here. I'm very delighted to be part of this group today. Um, both very great questions. And um, the way I think about it is, if you want to understand, if you want to admire a master's painting, you want to look at all of it. You don't want to look at a random half of it. Um, you, you need to see the complete picture to really understand what's going on. And like you just said, um, glial cells do make up half of our brain. And for a long time, the, the lore in, in, in the field had been that neurons are the ones that are communicating all of the information um, that our brain is transmitting. And that's kind of how we see the world around us interact with the world around us. Um, but it's, as we are increasingly thinking about glial cells, we are realizing that glial cells are actually constantly talking to these neurons. And that's changing how the neurons are able to do what they do. Um, and, and as we are starting to think about it more and more, we're realizing that many of the neurological diseases, autism, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, all of them have a glial component where it's not necessarily just the neuron that's affected, but it's really the conversation between these two cells um, that, that, that's affected, that's driving some of the disease aspects. And so um, really to understand how the brain is working and how when that doesn't work properly, we get aging, we get dementias or neurodegeneration or autism, we need to understand what the glial cells are doing, what half of our brain is doing. Um, so I think it's terribly important um, to start thinking about it um, from that perspective. And why worms is essentially on why glial cells haven't been studied so far. So in a human brain, if you think about it, you have 100 billion glial cells talking to 100 billion neurons all at the same time. So it's a very complex problem. And glial cells don't lend themselves very easily to um, quick manipulations. And it's very hard to study them in humans or in many of the other systems. So when I thought about we have to study these glial cells, we have to understand what is it that they are doing to contribute to any of these diseases, um, we thought we would deconstruct the problem. So that's really what my lab does. And the idea is very simple. Let's just take a simple worm, which has 300 neurons, 56 glia, not 100 billion. Try and understand what's happening in the simple setting. And that would then give us a very good framework to then scale up and see how that's affected in us. And the beauty of doing it in this way is that you can take a glia or a neuron from a worm, or you can take it from a human, and you, they both at the molecular level, at the levels of genes and proteins, are working in the exact same way. 
So the idea is if you understand the first principles deconstructed here first, that's a quick setting to do it. You can do all the manipulations you want to really get at the meat of the matter, and then you can scale up. And so that's kind of what's driving us to use the worm to try and understand the fundamental logic of how our brain is working and how is it that it's allowing us to do what what we do and help us continue doing it effectively. So and so so Akasha, one of the interesting things is you know I'm going to show my ignorance here, but when I was in medical school, I used to think of glial cells uh, sort of like asbestos. Uh, if you remember, pipes used to, a pipe was all covered by asbestos so that it allowed the water to stay hot as it went through the house. Um, and I thought of the glial cell as wrapping itself around the neuron and allowing the conductivity to be preserved. And, and we, know, we now know they do so much more than just insulate the neurons. Um, tell me a little bit about the complexity of what that relationship between a glial cell and a neuron is like now. Yeah, it's 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 uh, the more we look, the more complex we realize it actually is. So glial cells can can give rise to neurons. Even glial cells insulate the neurons, but they can also can decide which neuron can talk to which neuron and not talk to another neuron. So it can help establish even the basic circuitry. In fact, that's one of the things people think can go awry in diseases like autism or epilepsy, even. Um, neuron glial cells can even eat bits and pieces of these neurons away. So, it, and that's what um, people are thinking is contributing perhaps to dementias or or to neurodegeneration. So, they're not just passively insulating like an asbestos, but they're essentially directing where the pipes are going to be and how the drainage system is going to be set up or not. And that really decides how the flow is going to be. And so, Akanksha, you, 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 can you talk a little bit about what the research environment in at the Hutch in Seattle is? You know, we've got University of Washington. We've got the Allen Institute for Brain Science. We have a lot of people thinking about that here. And, and to me, this would seem to be a particularly rich environment to be doing neuroscience. Yes, um, absolutely. And that's really what drove me, um, uh, what got me to the Fred Hutch in part. Um, so one aspect is really the fantastic ecosystem that you just mentioned. I mean, having all of these fantastic researchers in the neighborhood that um, I can have close connections with, and I do, my lab does, um, and interact with it is a phenomenal um, ecosystem in which to do your science. Uh, but then on top of it, really, Fred Hodge and the basic science division where I am is, is really a stellar collection of absolutely fascinating uh, science and fantastic creative scientists um, that I get to call colleagues every day, interact with uh, in the hallway. And, and that really drives uh, synergies, collaborations, um, um, and informs some, some way of how we think about our science in a very out of box way. Um, so that's been a fascinating um, thing for me. And of course, um, Hajar is a very fostering and collaborative supportive environment. And we also have, of course, fantastic trainees and graduate students, um, which is really the icing um, on the cake. Um, yep. Yeah. Terrific. So, Akanksha, yeah. if you could stay on and we could bring Sita back, we have mm -hmm. time for some Q&A. I would encourage people to send some questions in. I have a bunch uh, that I'm working on as well, um, but I want to just uh, start off. Um, and the first question I'll ask to Akanksha is, so, Akanksha, you know, when you think about the wide variety of neurologic disease that we're nervous about, every, as you mentioned, everything from autism to Alzheimer's, um, what insights do you think that we've gathered so far on glial cell function that could impact, let's use Alzheimer's as an example, that could impact Alzheimer's? Right. So, um, one thing we're realizing is that, is that some of the molecules we thought or genes that we thought were implicated in Alzheimer's and, and, and were working in neurons, turns out those same genes are also expressed in the glial cells. And we're realizing that perhaps the, the first seed of what, what starts going, uh, going wrong is that maybe the glial cells um, get unhappy and they can't talk to the neurons in the way they should be talking to the neurons to maintain all of that biology. And that's what's causing part of the disease. Um, one aspect of it, and this is related to some of the things we do in our lab, is the glial cells can sometimes eat away bits and pieces of neurons, which is very important to maintain a properly pruned structure, if you will. But if you, for example, prune away too much or cut away more than you need, then you're starting to lose your memories. You're starting to lose the connections between the neurons you need to do. And uh, we are starting to realize that that's partly what's contributing to diseases like Alzheimer's even also Parkinson's, as we are realizing in the lab as well. And then for both of you, and maybe Sidi, you could start with this. Um, 
somebody listening to this from the from our allied professional group I would think my gosh Alzheimer's and liver cancer and pancreas cancer are so different um, how can a single research institution support both can you both talk about some of the things called shared resources and how how CETA you benefit from having a Conksha as a colleague who's working in neuroscience a Conksha how you benefit from being in a cancer center with people like CETA Sure, I can. So the shared resources are... Um, First of all, why don't you define what those are for people, because they probably yeah. don't know what shared resources are. Yeah, shared resources are, are centers at the Hutch that are all run by PhD scientists um, that are specialized in either um, genomics, in um, microscopy, in, um, and they, they, they organize an entire team of scientists with them to be able to... And so when we have to do an experiment, instead of learning all of that um, biology and techniques ourselves, we can reach out to the shared resources. I have, I can tell you in my time of, at the Hutch, I've used almost every single one. <laughs> um, they are remarkably uh, well organized and very functional. I usually meet with the PhD scientists. We talk about uh, the experiment that I'd like to uh, conduct we go through troubleshooting uh, tips and and then t sit with the data that comes back and um, and are able to analyze it together. And so it has remarkably accelerated my um, science because there's no way that I would be able to learn all of these individual techniques to the level at which um, these these scientists have. And, and Akashi, you use the same shared resources that CD uses, but you're in very different areas. Yes, absolutely. And I think I, I really do echo what Sita is saying. I think so, so we do, we have been doing some cutting cutting edge single cell genomics, high end super resolution microscopy imaging, and all of those techniques and know how it's not trivial to have in one lab yourself. But if you have access to these as a shared resources in the community, which I think Hutch is fantastic about, um, then you can have uh, much more unfettered ways of thinking about your own science because now you can think of those experiments and know that you have the support and the infrastructure you will need to do those kinds of experiments. So it really makes you a lot more ambitious in, in things you attempt in the lab. So um, I, I completely echo Sita um, on, on that as well. And in terms of you know having uh, people like Sita as colleagues, I think it, it helps also broaden uh, my perspective and, and think about the different ways in which the work I do is, is impacting even in the broader community. So for example, I've been thinking about autism and, and, and neurodegenerative diseases, but I, especially at the Fred Hutch, I'm, and I'm very well aware that, you know, glia-derived tumors are what have taken John McCain, Ted Kennedy, Bill Biden, um, and Hal Weintraub even. So when I think about what we find about glial cells in our work, um, the connections uh, um, in thinking about how that also impacts in our understanding of how these glial cancers are, are are being caused or what's going wrong in them is something that's now more on my mind than it had been before. So yeah. it's a new avenue of how I approach my science as well. Terrific. So see, that this question came in for you uh, that just came across here. And, and it's it says, Tom mentioned that pancreatic cancer is growing as a cause of death. Why is this? Yeah, so I think that's because maybe the rising, there's different risk factors for pancreatic cancer, and so some of which are um, the uh, obesity, and so the increasing rise of obesity that has um, uh, occurred over the years in the in the U.S. population is also driving an increase in uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, there's also, um, yeah, that's probably one of the biggest ones. Other Other risk factors are um, uh, smoking and things of that nature that can also really um, drive up the rates. Yeah, and can you comment a little bit? You were gonna, I, I think I cut you off when you were gonna comment a little bit what it's like for you being in a, an institution that has multidisciplinary scientists. Yeah, so I was going to say that um, for me, everything in cancer biology is the root is the normal biology, right? And um, a large part of my um, desire to come to the Hutch was actually the very strong basic science um, division. And, and that's because um, when, I, when, I, when I find something new in pancreas cancer or in bile duct cancer, um, it's, it's, it's rooted in normal biology. And so trying to, and, and trying to find a collaborator in the basic science 
division in order to understand first what how, how does normal development, how does the normal biology occur, and then how does that now go awry or be um, subverted in um, pancreatic cancer or bile duct cancer. Yeah. And, and so, Kongsha, the next question is for you, which is both of you have talked about the importance of of trainees in the work we do. And uh, both of you are are now um, what I would call mid-career. I know you think you're very early in your career, but you're already <laughs> mid-career. You already have PhDs and you did all your training and you're you're all grown up now. And so so training the next generation of scientists is a really big part of what you're gonna do uh, in your careers. Um, can you talk a little bit about graduate students and postdocs and the role that they play? Do you wanna go first? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I have all levels in the lab, so every everything from undergrad, so the Fred Hutch has, she has a wonderful summer undergraduate program, so it gives undergraduate students an, an ability to, to have their first experiences in the lab. Um, we have MD, PhD uh, students, PhD students, and postdocs, and these are all in order uh, as you, as they uh, increase their degree uh, level. And they, with that comes increasing um, levels of independence. And, and the idea is to be able to um, encourage and, and train and uh, foster uh, these trainees in order to launch their own labs uh, one day, either in um, academia, cancer centers, or, or in industry. And so um, it's a remarkably um, uh, satisfying and valuable and um, uh, to be able to give back because the, we, you know, we went through that whole process, right? And someone believed in us. Someone took the time to teach us, you know, how to troubleshoot our experiments, uh, you know, get through um, the, the, the failed experiments, but also the, to be able to identify the successful ones. And, and there's um, that, level of training um, as the one-on-one -on -one training is 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 really um, priceless and it's, it's wonderful now to be in the other position to be the one um, fostering and, and facilitating that so. great yeah I mean no I agree it's, it's partly paying it forward um, but also partly um, you know I see of uh, me as as somebody who is just polishing a, a gem that's already in the making and 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 it's 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 really fun because they bring in the new ideas the new energy and sometimes because they are unfettered by you know having grown and many years of lore in the system they sometimes come up with fa fantastic new ideas or new ways of looking at the same problem which is super exciting as well and i think um, at the hutch we are fortunate we have a fantastic uh, wealth of trainees um, and we are able to attract the very best from all over the country and it's it's fabulous to see them grow and evolve as as scientists in their own way. So, Kongsha, this next question came in from the audience, and I think it's a great question. Um, so, tell us about the minute or the moment that you realized you were going to become a glial cell researcher. Okay, you could have been like a researcher in so many ways. I mean, you, I'm sure there were a million things that came across in terms of what you wanted to do. But you decided at some point, ha, huh, I'm really into glial cell. What is it that did that and when did it happen? Um, great question. Um, for me, it happened towards the end of my PhD, actually. So my PhD was really in thinking about neurons and thinking about how the brain is developing, how you get the different neurons in the brain that let you smell or see or hear things. Um, and I, I realized that all of the processes I was studying of how the brain is set up and how it develops, all of the pipes, um, the same processes also give rise to this other cell type called glia, and they make up half our brain. But while we have textbooks upon textbooks of, on neurons and what they do and how they look, we barely had anything on glial cells. And so that when, when I started my, my postdoctoral research, um, I, just, I just went to one person who I knew at the time was starting to think about this too and said, I'm going to help set up the elegance as a powerful tool to get there because half of our brain is glia. We don't know anything. And the more I read, I realized we don't know anything partly because we don't have the right tools to get to the problem. We don't, we don't have the right access to these cells. Um, so that's kind of how I got going. I just saw this big glaring gap and I was like, how can you understand the whole brain if you're not looking at half of it? 
And so, Sita, I'm going to ask you the same question. Tell me the moment that you decided you were going to be working in pancreas cancer. So it actually started a long time ago. So I, my life was um, touched by cancer very young. So I lost my father when I was eight years old um, to to cancer. And, and so that kind of put in me, I was constantly unsatisfied by the, um, the, the answers I was given about the disease and about the therapy and, and the understanding. And so throughout my uh, training, I always gravitated to cancer biology as a um, as a as a as a, as a form of study, and and then as I kind of progressed, um, I was a little bit more agnostic in my PhD, but and did mainly um, therapeutic targeting. But but in my postdoc, um, I had the opportunity to um, shadow or um, uh, spend some time with some uh, clinicians. And um, I, I remember this time of, of going in and, and seeing a patient with uh, pancreatic cancer. And, and it was remarkable how, how little um, uh, options they, they had. And, um, and, I, and I just, I thought to myself, we need to do better, you know. And, and, and so that, that moment was, and, and then through actually um, choosing like, like a Kangsha, uh, a lab, understanding the biology um, and and just how what a remarkable foe it is um, and yet um, I do believe that through deeper understanding we we can do better and so that is so I want to thank both Akanksha and Sita for a fabulous discussion I want to turn this back over to Renee and Renee I would just say one thing all the people on this call um, interact with people who are in a position to be generous and helpful and if that discussion from those two young scientists did not convince you that we need to continue to support basic science, I don't know whatever will. So thank you to the people on the call, the Allied Professional Forum, for the work you do in advising uh, people. Um, and, uh, and I hope we were able to share some of the excitement at the Fred Hutch with you. Yeah, thank you, Tom and Sita and Akanksha for sharing your time and your knowledge. And I think Sita hit it right at the end you know, we have to do better. And my hope for today, for everyone on this program, was that you felt some kind of spark, that something that the researchers said or that Tom had said caught your interest or piqued you in some way that you thought, you know what, I wanna know more about the Hutch. And my biggest hope is that you wanna join us. So by investing in Fred Hutch, we and our clients can make this next breakthrough possible. We know that you are trusted advisors and that you have the ears of your clients, uh, you know, just like Tom said. So while you're busy helping these families plan and look at insurance policies and wills and estate plans, think of the hutch and you don't have to do it all. If you don't want to do anything except for say, hey, I think there's someone you, can you should be talking to, you can put us together. You can call any of the people on the council um, I can put you together with Renee Kurtzos. Um, there's just a thousand different ways to put your clients that have an interest in to hook in with the Hutch. So whatever your role, we really appreciate anything that you can do. Let's see. Um, another place that you can look is at hutchedplantgiving.org. No, plantgiving.fredhutch.org. That's the one landgiving.fredhudge.org, and you can find out more about Hutch, the Planned Giving Council, um, about different ways to give. And um, if you're interested, we'd love to get your, you know, you as a part of the Allied Professional newsletter. There's an e-newsletter that comes out, and we'd love to have you be involved in that way. One of the fun things we have coming up is a blitter ride. And in the past, it's always been um, a bike with a, a little run on the side. But now, because of COVID, you're able to participate in any way you want to. You can sign up. You can make a team. You can take your efforts and, you know, just run on your treadmill. You can walk with your family. You can ride a bike, ride a kayak, whatever you want to do. We'd love for you to join us for Obliteride. And that's obliteride.org if you want to learn more information there. I'm so grateful that you spent the hour with us. Um, I'd love to help in any way, and anyone on our council would also like to help. Thank you again for, for spending the time, and have a great day.